I'm overwhelmed with that introduction. Thank you very much. It is my privilege and a great honor to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Howard Cedar. The first time I met Dr. Cedar, I heard him speak in November 2005 at the Hadassah Hospital when I led ICRF Toronto's first mission to Israel. I was immediately impressed by his friendly congeniality, combined with his ability to impart his knowledge to us as lay people in words that we could understand. From that time forward, each time I heard him speak, I was more attracted to what he had to say and how he said it. When the time arrived when Bernie and I were able to contribute to fund a scientist, there was no contest. It was Howard Cedar all the way. Thank you, Howard. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to all of you. And I'd like to welcome you to the ICRF family. Um, as you may know or may not know, um, Israel is blessed with wonderful, wonderful scientists. Israel is blessed with an eternal source of scientists because every year there are more and more young people coming up. Each year they're more amazing than the year before. And each year they have contributions even better than the year before. This is a blessing that can't be taken for granted. It's a, an amazing thing. But as you may also know, science doesn't just depend on scientists. Science takes place only if society is willing to support it and interested in it. And from this point of view, Israel is blessed twice because we also have the wonderful, wonderful support of the ICRF, this society that you people right here. And, and believe me, we don't take it for granted. And I give, I give this introduction because I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I do, but hopefully you'll all realize that this is just a very, very small part of the wonderful, wonderful work that's going on in Israel, both in cancer research and other sciences, uh, and namely in basic science, which is the, the source, the foundation of everything that's done, all of the practical um, uh, scientific solutions uh, all start off as basic science. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about how we uh, contributed to this, starting with basic science. And you'll see that because we went into basic science and because our discoveries are of a very fundamental nature, it turns out that they're important in many, many different areas of biology and many, many areas of medicine. So my story starts in trying to understand how the human body develops. We all start off as a single cell. Half of the cell comes from our mother, half of the cell comes from our father. But we all start off as a single cell. And this cell divides to make two cells, and then divides again, they divide again. And over a period of time, the entire body gets formed. But of course, the body is made up of different tissues. Each of the tissues is composed of cells, but each body part is different. The liver is different than the kidney, and the kidney is different than the brain cells. And you can see that because all of those different cells, all of those different part, body parts do, do different things. Okay? And, and we were interested in this because it wasn't, mean, it wasn't clear how it works. How, from a single cell, how does this cell know how to make all these different body parts? How does it know how to make a liver at the right time? And how does it know how to make a brain at the right time? Just one little cell. How does it do it? And it was this curiosity that got us started. And, and I think that we came up with a, a very, very interesting solution. 
which turns out to be a solution that in the end is also useful for many things. Okay, so it, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna explain to you the, the discovery, okay? but I'm gonna explain to you in, in layman's terms so you'll be able to understand it. Of course, everything that we do has to do with chemistry and molecules, but hopefully I'll be able to explain to you what we've done. So we start off by thinking about all these different cells in the body that do different things. And we have to ask ourselves, what are these cells made of? And basically, it's made up of a lot, a lot, a lot of different components. We call those components proteins, but you can think of it as Lego. Our whole body is built up of a whole bunch of different pieces of Lego, okay? I'll give you an example of these pieces. Uh, for instance, if you look into your eyes in the mirror, you'll see that your eye, the iris of the eye, has a certain color to it. So that color is a pigment. That's one of the components that makes up our body. Okay. So that's one component. Another component, for instance, is in our blood, we have, in the blood cells, we have a protein, a component that's called hemoglobin. This is a very important component because this is the component that carries oxygen around the body, catches the oxygen in the lungs and carries it everywhere else in the body. And our whole body, the shape of the cells, what the cells do, how cells talk to each other, how cells, the color of the cells, all of these things are determined by these components. Now think about it. The body is put together by these components but it has to know how to make them. It has to know how to produce these components. And for this purpose, we have a book of instructions. And every cell has this book of instructions. And when the iris wants to make the blue pigment, it looks into the book, reads the book, the right sentence in the book, and in that way, knows how to make the pigment of the eye. And the blood cell, when it wants to make hemoglobin, all it has to do is look inside this book, find the right sentence, and that'll give it the instructions on how to make this wonderful protein called hemoglobin that knows how to grab oxygen in one place and give it off in another place. So what is this book? This book are our genes. These are the genes that we get from our parents, which is genetic material. This genetic material has a lot of names that you read about all the time. It can be called genes, it can be called genetic material, it can be called DNA. DNA is the substance that the genes are made from. It could be called chromosomes, because chromosomes contain all of these genes. All of those words are all there to describe this book. Now, where does this book come from? Well, the book comes from our parents. And it's present in that first cell. All of the book is present in that first cell. And in an amazing manner, when that cell divides, the first thing it does is to copy the book. So now there are two copies, and there's one for this cell and one for the other cell. And before they divide and make another, another two cells, they do the same thing, they copy the book. And as a result, every single cell in our body has this book that we got from our parents. So now it's very easy to understand if you're in, if you happen to be sitting inside the cell of the iris of the eye, there's a book, the book came from the parents. The book says, because of the parents, you should have blue eyes. The cell looks for the sentence, lists, looks at the instructions, and out comes a blue pigment, and as a result, you have blue eyes. Or if your parents, 
Or if you'd have brown eyes, then you have brown eyes. It's a little different. The sentence is a little bit different. And the same thing in every place else in the body. Nerve cells know how to talk to each other. They're different kinds of cells. They have a different shape, different size. They know how to talk to each other. Why do they know how to talk to each other? Because they have components that allow them to talk to each other. And how do they make those components? Again, they look it up in the book, the same book. OK, now comes the problem. Every, by the way, this book is an amazing book, <laughs> as you can imagine. First of all, I said the book is in every cell, so it sounds like it's very small. But this is an amazing book because it's the biggest book you've ever heard of in your life. This book has three billion letters in it. Just to give you an example, a, a volume of an encyclopedia like this has about three million letters. So if you wanted to reach three billion letters, you would have to take a thousand of these volumes of the encyclopedia, one on top of the other, it would get up to about 50 meters high, and that would be the same amount of information that's found in every cell of the body, which we can't even see. And of course, all this information is chemical. Okay, now the problem. The problem is that every cell of the body has the same book. But every cell of the body is different. In other words, every cell of the body is making different components. So how does that work? How does it work that every, one, every cell has the same book, but each cell seems to be selecting certain information from the book. So about 35 years ago, we came up with a solution to this problem, probably one of the most important solutions to this problem. And it, it's a very simple thing. It turns out that this book can be annotated. So it's true, the book is the same in every cell, has the same letters, the same words, the same sentences, but the book is annotated. And it's annotated chemically by something called DNA methylation. But we can look at it as an annotation. Every place that's methylated that has this annotation, every place in the book, that part of the book is not read. That's a sign. Just like when you take a text and you want something not read, you either cross it out or put an underline or put a little squiggle, but you don't want this to be read. And the same thing happens in the Book of Life, the book of our genes. And the way of annotating it is by methylation. So for instance, okay, in a, a liver cell, the gene, the piece of the book that you need to make the blue pigment of the eye, in the liver cell, it's there, but it's methylated, it's annotated, so it's not red. Whereas in the eye, that same piece of information, that same sentence, is not methylated, it's not annotated. And as a result, the eye cells read that piece of information and make the pigment. And that's the way every cell of the body works, and that's the way every component in the body works. So you have a text, which is constant in every tissue, but the body knows how to annotate it so that the text is used properly in the way that will allow the body to make different tissues of the body 
each of which does something different. Now this is basic science. It's interesting, it's very exciting, it's wonderful to be able to understand how nature works, to uncover, to unravel how nature works, and especially exciting to see how simple it is. That the whole, the whole thing is a, a simple, from a simple concept of annotation. But at the same time, this gives us very, very important information. And it's given us information about many, many different things. In agriculture, for instance, this turns out to be an extremely important thing because the plant uses this in order to fight off all sorts of um, um, bacteria and viruses that want to attack it. It's, it's important in cancer. When you see two cells, a normal cell, as opposed to a cancer cell, and you ask yourself the question, what's different? Why is this cell a nice cell that behaves normally, it doesn't grow too much, it doesn't bother its neighbors, it's very happy to be, to sit in the liver or to sit in the colon and do its job and not bother anybody. On the other hand, that same cell can turn into a cancer cell, a cancer cell which doesn't behave nicely. It divides rapidly, it can interfere with its neighbors, it makes poisonous substances, it can break off and go to other places of the body. What's the difference between those cells? The major differences between those cells are the text is almost exactly the same. The same book, almost exactly the same book. What's different is basically the annotations. And so the, the cancer cell behaves like a cancer cell mainly because it has different annotations, different instructions, different programming about what it should be doing. It's using the same information, but it's using it wrongly. It's using, using it differently. You've all heard about stem cells. Everybody's talking about stem cells. Stem cell, the idea of a stem cell is that at er, very early on, when the body is being made, there are cells that haven't decided what they're going to be yet. <coughs> they have the potential to be any cell. Those cells don't have any methylation. They don't have the markings. They don't have the annotations. As a result, they, they don't have that programming yet. They can be anything. You still have to program it to be something. So all this talk today about using stem cells, the whole principle of stem cells is based on this annotation system, this DNA methylation. And as a result, these discoveries were, are, 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 are changing the way we look at many, many different aspects of biology and medicine. And taking you through a journey, we started with basic research, we started with curiosity. Curiosity led to basic research. I must tell you that the ICRF is one of the few organizations to understand this concept, to understand that if you want to make progress in medicine, you have to start from the bottom, start from the basic information, start from the foundations, which is basic research. But if you do the basic research right, it opens up all sorts of practical and useful possibilities. With that, I'd like to stop, and thank you very much for your attention.